Okay, so a little about me. I'm a graduate student at Virginia Tech. I do research on secure embedded systems, in particular side channels. Uh, I like to work on hardware projects in my spare time. Recently, just last year, I started working, making a U2F token and then manufacturing it and selling it, and that's what, I'll, what I will be talking about. So the outline, about, uh, I'll start with talking about U2F, the different protocols, uh, what came before it. Uh, and how one takes a protocol and then makes good engineering decisions and how to like design hardware or uh, take hardware and implement a protocol on that securely and uh, affordably. And uh, the challenges that I face with like manufacturing them in particular, uh, what challenges a uh, security token brings to the table versus other regular products and then uh, how selling on Amazon went. Uh, one one question I get actually get asked a lot is like, Connor, do you, do you actually like, make any money off of this? Why are you, why are you doing this? And I'll, I'll try to answer that and give the, all, all the costs and actually money that was made from this. Um, I'm going to skip a couple of slides because I have a little less time than I thought I would. But U2F is stands for Universal Second Factor Authentication. It's a two-factor auth protocol developed by Fido Alliance and Google. Uh, it's relatively new. Uh, a lot of you probably have YubiKeys or know of them. They all support it. A uh, handful of browsers and services support U2F. I guess ad adoption of it isn't too widespread compared to the typical time-based codes or, or uh, SMS-based messages that most two-factor auth services use. But it is picking up. Uh, I originally found out about it when someone gave me a YubiKey uh, last year. And I wanted to figure out how it works. And it turns out it supports a a lot of different, pro or a number of different protocols, and I kind of wanted to make my own token. And in order to do that, you should be able to understand all the protocols and figure out which one's the best one to implement for. Uh, so for those of you that do have YubiKeys, you're probably familiar. You just stick it in, press the button, and out it spits out all these ASCII characters, the one-time passwords. Uh, OTP one-time password protocols have been around for uh, longer than U2F. Uh, Basically, they're kind of HMAC based, and the, the most basic scheme that you and a service, the service you're trying to authenticate for, have some sort of search secret that you agreed on previously, and then something like a counter, and then each time you generate a password, you increment the counter, take a hash of it, and then the service can validate that. Uh, time-based OTP, or TOTP, is based on HMAC, and just instead of using a counter, you use time. And this solves some synchronization issues that you might have with using a counter, like if a message gets dropped or something. Uh, so instead, you agree, you agree on an epoch, and then based on the time from that epoch, you, have, you can generate a different code and then give that to the service. The, probably the, the biggest downside to this, I think, is that the, you have, you're relying on the user to copy a code from your TOTP application or your TOTP token and copy it to the website. And so it's not really autonomous, and it's a short little code. It's not too, it works for, for what it does, but it's not too robust. Yubico OTP is definitely a big step up. It's autonomous. You stick it in, and it out spits, spits out the ASCII characters, and it works. It's based on all these fields internal to the token, private ID, multiple counters, a random number, checksum. Uh, but the, the problem for, for me, if I want to make my own, Yubico OTP doesn't really work because it relies on a third party server. And sure, I might be able to like make a token that can integrate with Yubico servers, but then I can't re really sell that because it covertly has a dependency on Yubico, which wouldn't work. Or I could run my own servers, but I'm just a cheap college kid, and no one would want to integrate with, with that. Uh, so, uh, next protocol I'll look at is U2F, and it's pretty sweet because it's basically just challenge response. And, that's it. You have a server example.com, it issues a challenge, and then your token can sign that. Example.com would have your public key, and it's easily validated. There's a couple other quirks, but uh, biggest one, you need to have a, a registration before that. The token needs to be able to generate a key pair unique to the service for example.com, and gives the public key to example.com and keeps the private key. Uh, so that. that adds a big constraint because your hardware token needs to be able to generate a key pair, particularly for elliptic curve. Uh, so it needs to have a sufficient source of entropy, so make sure that your, the keys it generates are indistinguishable from being, being random. Otherwise, it could potentially be du duplicated. Uh, the other 
potential challenges with this, with, the, with these arrows on the diagram, one and two, that has to go over some sort of transport. Uh, and with TotP, the transport is the user copying the, the code into the service, which is kind of lame and not autonomous, but with FIDO provides some pretty nice specifications for USB, Bluetooth, and NFC. And there's already service that have implemented these, so as me as an implementer, this is kind of nice. I have a nice spec to follow, and then once I do it, I have services that test it against immediately. And there's no third, part, third party involved. It's robust, secure, autonomous, it's great. So that's why, that's why I chose U2F. Um, going to make the hardware design goals, obviously you want it to be secure. Uh, and I don't just mean like protocol level security. As the, as the implementer, you kind of assume that U2F is already se secure. And I, you just have to worry about bugs underneath that. Main one being like, you have to write firmware, and, and if there's a bug in the firmware, which a very well could be that you, you don't want that to be used to uh, leak sensitive information or key material. So some form of isolation in the hardware would, would really be great, and you don't want to pick any chips that have issues with like locking the firmware or have open debug ports or something like that. And it should be cheap. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm just a graduate student living on a stipend, so to make this project work, you really, I, I don't want to like cut out anything important, but you really like have to make decisions to uh, that, that save costs and, and can't slack on that. And cri crypto performance is kind of like the catch-all term for when you implement crypto on, on embedded hardware is that it needs to run fast enough to work for your application. It needs to have enough uh, entropy to generate keys if it does that, enough memory and whatnot. Because if you run ECDSA on like an 8-bit processor, it's going to take forever. And you certainly don't want, a user isn't going to use a token that takes 10 seconds to, to authenticate. That's just not ergonomic. Uh, to demonstrate, uh, there's, this is a study done by uh, some researchers who presented at the NIST Lightweight Crypto Workshop in 2015. Uh, they just performed ECDSA for a number of different curves on different ARM platforms. What we're interested in for U2F is the 256-bit curve, which is the TAN bar. Uh, it take, between the platforms, it takes between about 100 milliseconds to about half a second, which is sort of bad. Ideally, you'd want it to be like under like 50 or 20 milliseconds for U2F. Um, and also keep in mind that ARMs are relatively high performance in the embedded world. If you were to implement this on a 16-bit or 8-bit processor, it would very well take between like one on the scale of 1 to 10 seconds. Uh, and so immediately we have like a conflict between being cheap and have, having performant crypto. Uh, but it's not really the end of the world. Uh, Good th great thing to look at look in is for hardware acceleration. Basically, on a particular chip, it's going to have all these peripherals in addition to the processor, most of which being ways to communicate with the outside world. But there's more specialized blocks for specific applications, one of which can be crypto, which is what we're looking for. Uh, it's really easy to find processing blocks for like symmetric ciphers like AES and DES. Most larger semiconductors will offer chips that have that, but uh, and, and it's easy to get a hold of it. But when it comes to asymmetric ciphers like RSA, ECC, uh, there's good selections for them by like uh, a number of different companies, but it can be really hard to get a hold of them. So, uh, so in the middle column, NXP, Infini, and ST Electronics, so they have great selections. But in order to get these chips, more often than not, you need to sign NDAs, pay licensing fees, have huge minimum order requirements, have a good reputation because uh, security in silicon is a sensitive area. If there's a bug in it, it's really hard to, to fix, unlike in software. Um, but there are some manufacturers that do have some security products with asymmetric crypto blocks like Atmel and Silicon Labs. Uh, this is an exhaustive list, but um, I, I ended up going with Atmel. But if any of you have experience with like getting through this NDA licensing barrier with like NXP, SD Electronics for some of these secure elements or crypto processing blocks, that, that would be great. I have not been able to break that, that barrier. Um, this is the chip from Atmel. It is an I squared C peripheral, so it's not a microcontroller, but it checks all the boxes that we need for U2F as far as uh, random number generation, acceleration for 256 bit elliptic curve. Uh, it has write only keys, and so this means that it can generate keys on the device using the random number generator, and they're put into write only memory to use for their crypto operations. It's impossible to read it off with software, and so that provides the isolation from the firmware to write the U2F application that checks the box for security. Um, also, they're cheap, like 70 cents per, per, per part, so that's great. Uh, 
still have to have an MCU or microcontroller to implement U2F, so I basically just picked the cheapest thing that does USB and that fulfills the transport requirement for the U2F token. Uh, I can implement everything after adding a button, LED, and some discrete parts you can implement with, with just eight uh, surface mount components, which is great. That should be easy to manufacture, do the PCB and assembly. Uh, my, my first layout was pretty rough. Was, I'm kind of new to this, but the second time around uh, looks a lot better. Uh, the, ma the major like the, uh, design for manufacturing decision, going from the middle picture to the last one, is the uh, packaging is QFN to SOIC, meaning the in the middle picture, the pins for some of the parts are underneath the package, and that's really hard to solder, and it's also really hard to test that the solder joints are correct in manufacturing, because you need to use an x-ray or something, and so that can be more expensive. So although the larger packaging parts may be more expensive, they're a lot easier to pick in place and verify that they've been soldered correctly, which in this case saved a decent amount of money. Uh, and it's, some of you probably think, like, this, this is not a final design, there's no case, and I just, don't have enough uh, money for it, basically, but I'm looking into it now. What I really like is to use some sort of embedded epoxy molding process or, or a PCB overmold, kind of like the uh, YubiKeys. Uh, another option is to use a USB case and then put them on, but that's kind of cheap. People can take them off. It's kind of a hacker project, so people can make their own case if they really want. Uh, firmware is what you expect of the different layers. Is, by the, the FIDO spec and offloads all the heavy work to the chip crypto chip. Since I picked the, the cheapest MCU, it only had 16 kilobytes of program memory and one kilobyte of RAM, which is pretty small, and I used all of it. And it wasn't that I just got lucky. Well, well I did get lucky, but uh, I ran out of memory multiple times while <laughs> development, which you have to go back and like figure out how to make things smaller, which can be a tough process. So be able, development time would have been a lot quicker if I had just picked it. MCU with USB and more memory. Okay, so manufacturing issues. Like I said, the PCB and assembly is relatively easy because there's only eight surface mount parts, but programming is, is not necessarily so simple, mostly because of the lack of memory in the, in the security components. Mostly like U2F keys have a requirement that they should be able to do device attestation, meaning they have a special key pair that proves that they were made by a certain manufacturer or, or me. And the crypto chip as well needs to be, be configured and locked permanently for U2F application. And the program to do that does not fit with the final program. There's just not enough memory. So, so is that. Um, so that means it needs to be programmed twice, which is extra complexity. And the private key isn't necessarily, for attestation isn't necessarily something I want to give to the uh, manufacturer, and so because of the extra complexity, there's more of a chance the manufacturer could make a mistake, and that mistake could propagate to everything and it could be pretty expensive. So my, my options are pretty much I could just do it all myself or re redesign with a USB MCU with more memory and then try to figure out a convenient way to do the attestation key. Uh, I just figured I'd just do it all, all myself. Uh, it's the safest way. I sent an order for 1,100 units. It costs just under four, four grand. It's about almost 400 for the printed circuit boards. Majority of the cost going to all the components in the assembly, and then $200 for shipping and tariffs. Um, tariffs are probably like $130 importing it into the US from China. Probably could have gotten around that by just working more closely with the uh, Chinese manufacturer, try to get, the to get them to declare the package as something else. Um, the, <laughs> that, which I, I, maybe it's a gray area, but I've heard of other people figuring out how to, how to do that. But, um, so $3,600 is kind of like the predicted cost on, on paper, and that's what it amounted to. But really, like, I guess projects like this, especially if you're new, are going to cost more. Uh, for me, I estimate probably about $500 spent over like the six, on and off, six months of on and off development, buying printed circuit boards, components, development boards, stencils, and then new reflow station, a labeler, and things like that. Uh, that's hard to predict in the beginning. So I guess my projected pro cost per token was about $3 in the beginning, but it was really like 
turned out to be almost $4, which, you know, an extra 80 cents may not seem that much, but that's like 30% increase in, in price. Um, so after I'm doing the program on my own, got the manufacturing order sent out, manually programming them took about one minute per token, uh, and I don't really want to spend multiple days all day programming these things, so to automate it, just figure out like a plug to put in each one and I can just crank through all of them and set up all my scripts to do the programming and uh, key management and the configuration. Um, and just to illustrate, there's just like time lapse. Um, it took about four or five hours, which is enough time to watch two movies, cranked it out in a night, literally just like plugging in, waiting for the light to turn on. I got some nice parallelism with like having three programming stations set up at the same time. Um, Next up is the, the Amazon distribution. So Amazon, it's a program called FBA, Fulfillment by Amazon, where they sell stuff for you. Um, this is great because I don't really want to spend the next year making up to 100, 1,000 different shipments to people. I would have no life. And so Amazon does the work, and they also have great um, exposure so that people don't just see your, your website once and forget about it. They, they'll, they'll continue to see it. And the, the downside is that they do take like a cut, cut of what you, what you sell. Uh, they do have a small, a small and light program that qualifies for like small products like the U2F token, so that worked out pretty well. Now when you want to sell something on Amazon, there's a number of different ways you can go. If there's, exist, there's an existing listing on Amazon, that's going to be the easiest because then you just copy that listing and then it, you sell it under your seller account. But if there's not a selling uh, uh, listing already, then you need to apply to Amazon to get your brand approved, which can be tricky. So I figure like I am gonna, I'm the only person involved in this. I am the brand owner for U2F0, just like the brand. Um, and you have to do a number of things, like make a website, get your brand printed on the packaging, blah, blah, blah. And I applied, and Amazon just like wouldn't recognize it. It was never like good enough for them. They always wanted to have the brand printed directly on the packaging, have a better website, and I'm like, oh geez, I really don't want to like invest time and money into like some silly packaging and a stupid website that no one cares about. But fortunately, they do have another application process for people that do not own the brand, but they're just authorized sellers. And I figure out well, for that process. Um, <laughs> the authorized sellers aren't necessarily responsible for the packaging or the website. So I wrote a letter to myself asking for permission <laughs> to sell. To, to sell it on Amazon, to and from. So I generously signed and gave, gave permission. And Amazon very promptly approved this, within, like within minutes. It's great. So I think like problems like this kind of like pop up because Amazon seller processes are all like very automated and very little human interaction. So I guess it's both good and bad in this case. Um, sales have been pretty good. For like the first two weeks, there was like nothing, and I didn't really expect anything because I didn't really tell people about it. I just kind of let the listing sat there, and I worked on a blog post for a few days and like really like made it look nice and quietly submitted it to Hacker News and rose to the top. And then sales have just been like pretty steady ever since, kind of like selling between three and twenty per day. Interesting enough, there was a boost during the holidays, which I was surprised about. I don't, know, I don't think I honestly don't really know my market too well. But um, sold 80% of the inventory so far, which is great. I was aiming for like a year, and then this is just within the last five months in, in, in the US. Um, of the 1,100, I sent 1,000 to FBA and kept 100 in stock for like replacement purposes and like giving them out to people and whatnot. So that increased the cost per unit to just over $4. Amazon takes $2 out of every sale and sold it for dollars so that's about a 30 percent selling margin and between like how much money you make in the its cost it makes a 43 percent return on investment and since this project runs in like on it's going to run in under a year that's I, I guess that's pretty good um, there, were, there were some problems not everything went perfectly namely the device attestation keys I made unique for each token motivation being if someone like can't like if they compromise one key that won't cascade to everything else and just made sure they were all signed by the same master key. However, U2F's original intention was for them to actually be all the same, and that way they could be identified for one particular manufacturing batch. And since they're unique, they can be uh, used as unique identifiers. So, 
But unfortunately, another constraint is that there's only enough room for 15 registrations due to the crypto key only having enough memory for 15 private keys. So it can only be used up to 15 times. But I'm planning to do another batch. If anyone has a problem with this, I'll give them a free replacement. Um, in addition, some buttons get torn off. It's just a PCB. Okay, yeah. Feedback was better than I expected. I was aiming for like three stars. <laughs> and uh, if anyone wants to get involved, I'm looking for help uh, for, the, for the next run. Uh, thank you. Every, everything's on GitHub. And I have extra tokens if one of you wants one. Why did I or didn't? Who says he did it? <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know if I can say. <laughs> yeah, maybe in the next one I'll backdoor. <laughs> <Let's see. laughs>